Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. My Little Pony. The My Little Pony franchise consists of a series of toys and cartoons created and owned by Hasbro. Yes, that Hasbro. As anyone with even a passing familiarity with the subject hearing the name will know, the target demographic is small girls, and Hasbro generally regards the animated component as an advertisement for the line of toys, just like Transformers and Black Library books Balam Balam Balam. The Brinny, an oh so clever portmanteau of bro and, well, yeah, is a recent, ish, term for, in the strict sense, a male fan of the show. These fans, who originated on and have since gathered considerable infamy on the internet, are also called or refer to themselves as ponifags, horsefickers, and a variety of other monikers, and while every enthusiastic fanbase on the internet tends to sow drama everywhere they go, the Brinnies have had their notoriety given a leg up by moderator temper tantrums and mass banning across 4chan, not to mention the occasional mention in the mainstream media. The MLP franchise as such has been around since the 80s and was beginning to lose traction with the economic downturn, but the most recent revision, begun in 2010, has seen an explosion of popularity on the internet, although there was at least one very famous early adopter, amassing a cult following not only among ironic hipster young women but of adult, or at least putatively adult, men. Strangely, 40k fans have a strong presence in My Little Pony, friendship is magic fandom. Perhaps simply as a break from grimdark, but often encouraging the purging of heresy and humanity curb stomping ponies. Basically, the MLP, thin version of humanity, fuck yeah, is Warhammer 40,000 or its mentality embodied by humans plopped in Equestria. A legacy typical to 4chan, when the fourth generation of the My Little Pony show, led by Lauren Faust, who had a hand in the creation of works like Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends and the Powerpuff Girls, first aired on television, it found itself being discussed on Co. Whether the first people to talk about the show were male or female is a mystery, but the fact remains that the show itself was vibrant, colorful, and contained some essential elements that have been present in a lot of big cultural phenomena since jobs and money have become more scarce. Namely escapist and romantic themes, including a society where everyone has a role in life thanks to their most prolific talent being stamped on every pony's butts, they almost always wind up working in the right jobs, with unemployment being all but unheard of. However, the show also featured some, possibly unintentional, dark undertones starting off. There were hints of political dissent, infidelity, ponies who couldn't find their talents doomed to a life of carting manure, and an episode that strongly hinted one of the ponies was a lesbian with an interspecies girlfriend. Most of these undercurrents have been all but lost as of the third season. But at the time, these niggling strings proved hilarious for adults to grab hold of to unravel the sweater of the show. An animation error even led fans to invent a cross-eyed character, who was later formally adopted into show canon and then subsequently banned by Hasbro Corporate, until Hot Topic pointed out tons of money could be made by lifting the character idea from the fans. Growing interest in the show, coupled with a range of expressive screen caps, caused My Little Pony to spill out of co. People began using MLP for reaction images, and naturally, this raised a few eyebrows. Threads wound up being derailed as people demanded to know what in the hell they were looking at, and bored regulars got tired of seeing it explained all the time. It interrupted discussion because it was confusing and new, some began to get angry for this reason, and others got mad because they simply didn't like seeing a cute girl's cartoon becoming a popular cultural thing on a site known as a den of racism and hatred. It kind of screwed up the rep. Ultimately, MLP probably would have come and gone in the natural order of things, rising up then waning again between seasons. However, 4chan has, for years now, tolerated increased moderator activity, including overhauls to mod power which allows them to ban larger crowds for smaller infractions. This wouldn't have been a problem if the moderators weren't so bad at using their increased power. 4chan's mods are dumbasses. It is not a secret, 
And sadly, they felt it was their sacred, sworn duty to make an ultimate decision on whether or not My Little Pony should be discussed on the website. They arbitrarily decided the answer was no. Double quote. Thus began the show's meteoric rise, with the conflict between mods and the show's growing fanbase attracting all the more attention and sparking up debates across multiple boards. Posting pony-related content of any type became a bannable offense everywhere and users began to take sides. Ponies quickly became a tool for trolling mods and those in the opposing camps, and needless to say, it all became a complete clusterfuck. It was essentially 4chan moderation at its finest, and the final result is a lingering, yet slowly passing aftertaste where many remember a time that they could not get away from My Little Pony if they visited 4chan at all. Eventually the moderators had to cede some ground because, as they still have yet to learn, crowds are governed by consent, and the mods didn't have the resources to ban enough dissenters to gain consent by the majority remaining. In a rare moment of Pyrrhic victory, 4chan had actually defeated the site's largest moderator rampage to date. However, although ponies were once again permitted on Co, a terse standoff remained, as the mods do not like to lose and they weren't willing to call it quits on the fight. My Little Pony was allowed a single thread on Co. It was not the first time that a general thread was used to contain something the moderators did not like to see, but it is a notable landmark in 4chan history, since the use of general threads for the mod's benefit has expanded greatly as a practice afterward. Users went along with it, since it was better than a universal ban, a script was created that directed people to the general threads, which were very active and populated by numerous artists, including TGS own Weaver, the man responsible for Ruby Quest, then going by the name Glitter Glue. Unfortunately, the mods were still idiots. Occasionally, 4chan staff would pop in and delete the general thread, which caused chaos. The only possible result was that countless new threads would pop up and almost the entire front page of Co would be attempts to recreate MLP general. 4chan staff would go on banning the new threads ad nauseum, and users would find it impossible to establish a proper, organized thread that followed the rules. This caused various forms of rebellion. Sometimes the general thread would be completely relocated to a different 4chan board where mods didn't seem to be as active. There the new general would stay, irritating the locals, until the mods left and the people were allowed to reorganize again. This ongoing strife of argumentation, kicking the fandom hive, and the growing size of the fandom itself eventually forced the mods to come up with a plan so that they could have things their way while still resolving the problem. Unwilling to admit that their actions were at odds with 4chan itself due to the numerous effects of the abuse, Moot and the moderators once again established a global ban on My Little Pony. But this time, Moot offered an apology which proved empty over time, and he created a new board where the show was to be discussed exclusively. The board was called MLP. So surprisingly, the pony fandom has had a huge impact on 4chan in general and can be inferred to have caused Moot to rethink the way he runs the site in some degrees. Not in a positive direction, sadly, he merely works on ways to slow 4chan down to make it easier for his staff to control everything so that he'll never have to admit a tactical loss to his user base again. From mean to subculture. In terms of mainstream reception, the MLP fandom and Bronidom in particular have been somewhat mixed. Naturally, like most fandoms involved in children's media, it inevitably contains a wretched hive of scum and villainy full of shit ranging from innocuous but eyebrow raising works, to outright pornography, to not infrequently blatant pedophilia. Though how many such fandoms have articles, a documentary, and an off-Broadway play as well as sites dedicated to exposing the worst of them is another matter entirely. Somewhat in contrast to the way furries were received when they, initially, came to the public's attention, people generally viewed them in an odd at best sexual sort of way, while brinnies are generally regarded as a harmless, even endearing phenomenon. It should be obvious by now, online it's a different story, and no matter how you spin it, a lot of similar fandoms haven't had the impact on shit the way MLPs has, having their own convention certainly counts for something. Your guess as to what? Like many things on 4chan, parts of TG by no means excluded, what began as a wildly unserious community with little claim to relevancy has expanded to encompass some undeniably talented people, 
not unlike the furries. Also like the fur fags, some of the Brinny artists actually generate a fair bit of income out of their manchild fellows, and of course, there are those non brinny and non furry artists are willing to sell their souls and take commissions of fur and hoof for coin. All in all, it's basically like in that classic cartoon about furries. In fact, a lot of online artists taking commissions state right front and sent no anthro or no ponies or the converse, or even ponies okay but nothing NSFW, etc. Comma the tide of momentum it once possessed has long begun fading, of course, but for better or worse it's hard to forget a big first impression. As far as conventions go, attendance is down, which means casuals are departing, which usually means only the most hardcore fans, usually including the degenerates, are left. A subject of scub among the fandom is if the show got better or worse after Lauren Frost left. However one can look forward to laughing at both the rage and butt that that will come when the show is replaced by a full season of 30 minute episodes of the Equestria Girls spin off after season 9. Or whenever MLP Gen 5 is ever released. But you know Hasbro. They like to find the dumbest way to do things. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. On TG. Far TG UYS have a historical record of wishing to be the little girl, but the days when TG stood for totally gay and or how games have long since passed and are merely a happy memory now, so our beloved board responded to the pony plague in much the same way that TG responds to everything it doesn't know how to feel about, violent anger. For serious, it's just another iteration of the same thing. We saw it before with Tao Hao, we'll see it again some other time and wish that ponies were the least of our problems. Regardless, TGS mods never learn from their past mistakes, and fired up the commissariat, discussion of my little pony on TG is now extra heresy and will be responded to with bans. Because much like with Chakots before them, TG has a built-in excuse literally as old as TG itself. Suffer not the furry to live. Ponies are still common as hell on B, F, and Co, but they are infrequently brought up on the other boards anymore, TG included. The addition of the MLP board gave Brinnies a general board to post their content. The mods make it too much trouble to fight for it anywhere else, as the global ban is still in effect and the chances of it being lifted before the fandom dies out is slim. The general reaction to any mention of ponies on TG varies between simple exuberance, to indifference and apathy, to corn pausing rage depending on how well you roll, though the second scenario is more prevalent overall. Even with the bans in place, fans on TG have proven their time honored ability to get shit done and produced a veritable arsenal of pony flavored RPGs, including titles like Don't Rest Your Hooves, Ponyfinder, Poor unfortunate foals and other things that can be found on the internet and had their genesis in TG. It just goes to show that even when something's completely ridiculous, TG won't be prevented from dicking around with it and trying to make some win in the process, or at least prying some laughs and mockery out of it. If you go looking around the seven internets, you can even find fan fiction about the main cast playing D&D, which is like product placement inception when you remember it's all owned by Hasbro now. Just as planned. While 40k has fallen to the filthy plague of pastel colored horse loving man children, regular Warhammer has not, owing to the fact that WHFB has largely languished in obscurity outside the tabletop scene in comparison to its futuristic, grimdark counterpart. Overlapping fanbases have resulted in large amounts of crossover fiction and fanit, including the somewhat bizarre meeting of MLP and Warhammer 40,000, amongst others and they are guaranteed to incense at least a few people every time they rear their mutated heads. Including you, once you reach this page's gallery section. Look out, here it comes. Oh yeah, 
Most of the Dawn of War cast also did VAR work on film, most notably Farseer Toldir's VAR, Princess Celestia, and Faravius Karen, Chief Thundernauts, done in the exact same voice even. Meanwhile, Shazo Kai's is done by the same guy who does a gay sea serpent and an annoying little kid on the show. MLP. MLP is one of 4chan's more active boards. It's also probably the most tragic. During seasons 1 and 2 of My Little Pony, the board was populated with a huge number of fans discussing the show. A few of TGS old artists, who haven't been seen around TG proper since the Great Content Purge of 2009, were there on a regular basis producing hilarious comics, stories, and drawings for the young fandom. The extreme proliferation of materials led to the creation of a website called Equestria Daily, as well as numerous others, and thousands of YouTube parodies and song remixes which range from very good to inconceivably terrible. However, in the time between seasons, MLP finds itself struggling to discuss new content. The board was made mainly to satisfy 4chan's moderators, not because the fourth generation of My Little Pony had so much going on that an entire board to itself was really necessary. During these times, the site discusses or sometimes destroys fandom artists, official show staff, or Hasbro's corporate politics. In time, the fandom had also developed a number of ongoing subcultures that were entirely sustained by fan artists. Notable examples include or included Fluffy Ponies, Milky Way, Flitterape, Anonin Equestria, Ponies on Earth, Satyr Abomination, Ass Worship, Bat Ponies, and whatever else can be made into a series during the hiatus. In other words, the board is active, but somewhat starving for material related to the actual show. The board also had a terrible janitor who was so bad at his job that he became a joke around the site. He was often apathetic, deleted threads inexplicably, and didn't seem to have a purpose beyond wasting everyone's time. Eventually, the board named him Scruffy, after the janitor from Futurama who seems to have no purpose or positive influence on anything. After that, he was always depicted as the character, and Scruffy's face was sometimes plastered over questionable or NSFW content as a kind of jab at the guy. He wasn't exactly liked, but he wasn't a scourge. Yet. Eventually, that changed. For unknown reasons, possibly a visit by Lauren Faust, Scruffy began a crackdown and MLP got to relive the days of bands and fighting for the right to post content on their own board. He arbitrarily chose a number of the generals to die, some because of racy content and others just because he didn't like them and global rule number 6 allows a mod to delete anything he feels falls outside of positive contributions. He rapidly went from a character teasingly thought of as someone who couldn't do a job to someone who was actively doing his job very badly. Further outrage ensued when screen caps from the hidden janitor board, Jay, revealed Scruffy to be a total dickhole who obviously kind of hated the board, maybe all of 4chan while we're at it, but that's our moderators for you. Around this same time, Hasbro realized they were sitting on a money printing machine. And instead of standing back and leaving it alone to just print money, they began hitting it with a sledgehammer in the hopes that the machine would produce some kind of totally new money with a more enticing scent that would be more valuable. It didn't. Lauren Faust left the show by the middle of season 2. The exact reasons have been left to speculation, but it probably a variety of causes. MLP has been noted for dealing with constant executive interference and its writers have complained that there are frequently too many chefs in the kitchen. But there's also evidence of some events in Faust's personal life which may have led to her resignation. Anyway, by the end of season 2 and all of season 3, Hasbro was actively injecting lame ideas into new episodes, culminating with the release of a brilliant plan, clutter the main character up with a pair of goose wings and call her a princess. Disney is making tons of dosh on princesses. How could this go wrong? Then they took their next step. They introduced a spin-off called Equestria Girls. It was a novel concept in the way that it took a bunch of young adult characters with clear future prospects, an open world full of magic, and a friendly, colorful atmosphere, and then completely obliterated all of that by making the ponies into human, teenage girls trapped in Mithafucking High School. It was a movie and the entire plot revolved around how much the high school basically sucked compared to the pony universe. To the total, 
utter, unparalleled shock of Hasbro's astounding marketing teams. Somehow, a show about pastel girls and the shackles of a tired, stressful cliché of a system did not capture quite the same audience. Season 4, 5, and 7 were heralded as awesome by the show's fans, while season 6 was much more scubby, as many felt that the creator's Zoc was taking up too much screen time and wrecking the lore. Season 4 gave us a huge fight between Tarek and Twilight, which you can watch here. 5 introduced a cult of equality dedicated to erasing cutie marks, the cutie mark crusaders get their cutie marks, and time travel. Twilight gets a student of her own who is obscenely powerful and might be the creator's pet. Season 6 had several sweeping changes to the Equestria, the biggest being the overthrow of Queen Chrysalis. Season 7 has the return of 6 legendary heroes from pony history, including a wizard named Star Swirl. Equestria Girls 234 were near universally despised. The pony movie was very much scub. Some loved it, some hated it. The Forgotten 8 is MLP, 1986-1987. One of the big reasons why Friendship is Magic took off was because it decided to mix girly, slice of life stories with surprisingly decent, well, sometimes, action fantasy stories. In fact, the original draft of the show was literally more or less a Dungeons and Dragons show being told in a world of cute pastel colored ponies, but that was too expensive, so the emphasis was shifted to the cute slice of life stuff. But what few remember is that this wasn't so much a novel idea as a legacy. See, way back in the 80s is when the very first MLP animation showed up, in a director TV special called My Little Pony, Rescue at Midnight Castle, or My Little Pony. Firefly's adventure, depending on where you saw it. Kids watch this, often reluctantly, expecting cutesy stuff suitable for little girls. Instead, two minutes in, our cutesy pastel colored ponies are attacked by an army of flying snake dragon things called Stratons, whose presence is announced by a lightning storm out of nowhere. They kidnap two of them and drag them to a nightmarish castle that looks like a little chunk of hell straddling a rocky cliff high above a storm-lashed ocean, where the demonic leader of the Stratodons is made to kneel before the bastard love child of a centaur and Satan, who pets an ominous sack that pulsates with an audible heartbeat and has a voice straight out of any boys-oriented 80s fantasy cartoon. This is Tyrek, our big bad for the special. His goal? To kidnap four of the ponies and painfully transform them into monstrous dragon things to pull his flying chariot, so he can use the magical rainbow of darkness to snuff out all light in the world and create a night that never ends. And the special plays all of this completely fucking straight, no punches pulled, even going so far as to end with Tyrek being blown to bits by a magical rainbow. How did they follow this up? With a second special, Escape from Katrina, or Katrina. Again, where our pony heroines are captured by a mad cat folk which who intends to work them to death to provide her with an endless supply of her power augmenting drug of choice, which we'd potion. And then came the movie, where the ponies are driven from their home, which is permanently destroyed, by a trio of witches who unleash the smoz an ocean sized slime with a sadistic hunger to devour all life it can encounter, and whose touch sucks the positive emotions out of you. Then came the TV series, explicitly set after all of this, so you'd think they'd ease up and make it more girl friendly, right? Wrong. The series continued the tradition of trying to be a typical action adventure fantasy show of the era despite its cast of pastel pony protagonists, with pretty much every episode involving some kind of monster or disaster. Even the cutesy episodes included things like a poorly chosen wish creating droughts and wildfires that nearly kill the ponies or an uprising of now sapient furniture. Other episodes included a bard forced to steal shadows to feed the hunger of a demonic master, a giant stone dog trying to petrify the world, an icy Nazi penguin elementalist trying to freeze the world, a vain pig sorceress kidnapping ponies to turn them into glass statues so she could admire herself in them, living weeds trying to suck the life out of the forest, with a guest voice of Optimus Mathefa King Prime as a giant crab cop. Comma a goat necromancer sealed away in a time lost city, a lava demon that wanted to burn the world to ash. Don't get us wrong, there were some cutesy slice of life stories in there, but for the most part, this was actually a pretty decent, by 80's standards, fantasy adventure show.
So it developed something of a hidden cult following amongst boys who watched it alongside their sisters because it actually held up decently well alongside other tunes of the era. It wasn't until the third generation of toys and their attendant time cartoons that the emphasis shifted to focus exclusively on cute girly stuff and the guys drifted away. Rural is a great app available on the Apple and Google Play Store as well as desktop for creating beautiful 8-bit character art. The app has 14 supported races, 150 plus weapons, 400 plus armor pieces for you to mix and match, 20 plus mini bases. There is that much to work from I was able to make Cold Steel the Hedgehog, the God Emperor of Mankind, Pepe and they are always adding more artwork. The app also has a character sheet to help keep track of everything during games. And if that wasn't enough you can play about with the app for free with limited artwork. So go ahead check it out and if you decide to buy the app use promo code NICKBEDIA for 10% off and it lets them know we sent you. It's a great sponsor and a great app and we hope you guys go ahead and check it. But let's get back to the video. My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, 2010 to 2019. Spoilers, obviously. History. In the ultra distant past, King Groger invented countless monsters who took whatever they wanted and destroyed the rest. He's called the father of monsters, and it's implied he created dragons, manticores, windagus, and other horrors. In the distant but not quite as distant past, the three tribes of ponies, earth ponies, pegasi, and unicorns, live in their own nations. They aren't quite at war, but they all hate each other. A terrible winter storm blows in, freezing and starving them and worsening relations. So all three tribes set out to find a new home. Turns out the winter storm was caused by creatures called Windigus, not to be confused with Wendigus, who feed on hatred and are repelled by friendship. So the three tribes become friends and drive the Windigus away, and found a new country called Equestria. Two immortal god princesses are crowned rulers of this new nation, Princess Celestia, who rules the sun, and Princess Luna, who rules the moon. Shortly thereafter, Equestria is menaced by a variety of threats, the Sirens and the Pony of Shadows are two of the biggest threats, though it's a dangerous world and there's the occasional pissed off dragon or cruel sphinx. The banishment of the Pony of Shadows leads to the creation of Equestria's most powerful magical artifacts, the Elements of Harmony. These are the win button in Equestria, not even the most powerful reality warpers are immune to these things. Several more threats menace Equestria, and the princesses fight them all off with the elements of Harmony, Discord, Tyrek, and King Sombra most notably, but it seems likely there were more. This culminates in MLP's own version of the Horus Heresy, the corruption of Princess Luna into Nightmare Moon, and her subsequent banishment to the moon, which is clearly stolen from the true and honest story of the fate of Sylvana in the classic webcomic Sonichu, just like the unicorn sacrifices totes are stolen from the sicker sacrifices in 40k. The show starts a thousand years after Nightmare Moon's banishment. An upper class shut in nerd named Twilight Sparkle is sent to a rural backwater town to make friends. Despite initial misgivings, she makes them and six ponies reactivate the elements of harmony and become their new bearers. Most of the show is about these six ponies everyday problems and how they're resolved, but season premieres and finales often are heavier on the lore and adventure. Races. Ponies, obviously. Unicorns, earth ponies, and pegasi make up the vast majority of pony races. Earth ponies are natural farmers, and provide almost all of Equestria's food and lumber. Pegasi can move clouds around, and are in charge of the weather. Unicorns once raised and lowered the sun, but that required 10 of the tribe's young men and women to give up their magic for life, every day. Sounds awfully familiar to Tilly stolen it's not stolen it's all Hasbro from 40k. Since Celestia and Luna took on the burden of raising and lowering the sun, the unicorn's niche hasn't been as clear. One might say their role is to advance the study of magic and technology, though a lot of them don't have magic beyond telekinesis. A few of the notable other races are described below. Griffins, greedy, selfish creatures. Were once a proud warrior race, now they live in straw shacks and grab every bit they can. Currently allied with ponies. Buffalo, 
pretty much the setting's Native American equivalent. Share territory with ponies. Crystal ponies, a kind of pony that lives in the Crystal Empire. Have translucent skin and polygonal pupils. Dragons, pretty close to D&D's dragons, but not as evil. One of them falling asleep near Equestria is a major threat, as their snores produce unbreathable smog. Currently allied with ponies. Changelings, love eating shapeshifters. Think succubi and doppelgangers rolled into one. Went through a civil war, most of them mutated to be non-parasitic. Currently allied with ponies, aside from their rogue queen Chrysalis. Yaks, rugged, Tibetan culture based around smashing things that aren't perfect. Currently allied with ponies. Hippogriffs, a race of pony birds pony fish, they can switch between these forms, who were once hiding from a villain known as the Storm King. Currently allied with ponies. Breezies, tiny butterfly ponies who live in a magical land only accessible through the special portals. Other setting tidbits. The show's tech level is very weird. Guards carry spears while video games and LED screens exist. The simplest explanation is that as Equestria has never fought a real war, there hasn't been a necessity to innovate better weaponry, and thanks to a reasonable prevalence of magic, it's often easier to rely on the fact that one stroke three of the population can use their forehead as a gun. Though they do apparently know what tanks are, so make of that what you will. It could be referring to a water tank, or it could just be the creators not fully thinking through the implications of everything. Close bracket. Magic is an everyday thing at a low level, with roughly one stroke three of the population being basic casters and the other two stroke three having passive magic. Powerful spillcasters are very rare, with Twilight Sparkle and Starlight Glimmer the two most notable ones. Being attacked by monsters has become an everyday thing for the town of Ponyville, as they border the Everfree Forest. Everfree is a very strange place to the ponies, where nothing works as it should. The clouds move on their own, for example. Around puberty, every pony figures out their special talent, which is represented as a mark on their butt. There was a cult of equality that removed ponies' cutie marks. Side note, so, what's the appeal? More seriously, if you want to know how to make something with roughly the same appeal as MLP, there are a few possible suggestions. Roughly the same idea as bunnies and burrows. In that on one side you have harmless creatures who mean very little harm to most people, and on the other you have a dethroned intent on destroying their community. That the ponies are more powerful than the bunnies doesn't change much of the appeal, because most of their powers are usually only combat useful with some creativity. Mild utopianism. In the same way as Street, TNG's Federation, while they are, usually, better as a society than their enemies, they have flaws weaknesses, and constraints that they are aware of and try to make the best of. Xenofiction. They're not human in many ways, and that affects many things in the way they see the world. For the many seasons of Friendship is Magic, low-key slice of life fantasy. It initially was a series where the apple harvest is, in its own way, as, or, depending on who you ask, more, important than that dragon over in the mountain. Since the dragon is more or less keeping to himself, and can be negotiated with, while well those apples aren't going to harvest themselves. Not much fantasy focuses on this lower power level. Nonviolent resolution is the default preferred option. If you've played with enough murder hubbus, you'll see the appeal. If you haven't, you might not, but trust us, it's quite real. And, for TG, there's always that one dude who wants to stat out everything because he desperately needs to know how many unicorns you'd need to take out a dragon, and, depending on the dude, what tactics would work best for each side, and or whether a rocket launcher would change that number. And MLP, FIM, at least initially, provided enough lore meat that statting up generic ponies and monsters wasn't that hard if you made a few assumptions. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.